So as people are walking in here, just if you don't know what that video was <laughs> that was playing, um, before this meeting, I wrote a blog post, which I shared with the ISG and the IAB in advance for comment, and it was titled, Something for Everyone at IETF 102. Uh, and it had a little bit of a humorous flair to it. And um, Allison actually asked, oh, is that, is that a reference to comedy tonight? Because the whole idea was that it was, it was trying to, the blog post was trying to be funny. And I had never heard of comedy tonight. So we went and, and dug up a video. Um, and it's a, it's a song from a musical from the 1960s. Uh, a funny thing happened on the way to the forum. By Stephen Sondheim, thank you. Crowdsourcing this. <laughs> Uh, but the lyrics are so on point. Something familiar, something peculiar, something for everyone, a comedy tonight. Welcome to the IETF 102 plenary. <laughs> Hi everyone, I'm Alyssa Cooper, I'm the IETF chair. And it's lovely to be here with all of you in Montreal, the world home of circus. Also somewhat on point for the IETF and hopefully not for the plenary, but for the IETF as a whole. People might not remember this, but this particular meeting was originally scheduled to be next week in San Francisco. And we ended up changing it due to some concerns about uh, visa issues and immigration issues in the United States, we decided to move it to Montreal, and in order to do that, we had to change the dates. We had to move it back to this week. I think what people really don't realize, though, is the incredible foresight of the IETF Administrative Oversight Committee in making that switch, because what that meant was that, in addition to us having our working meeting here this week, we would coincide with two very important world events, those being the World Cup and World Emoji Day. <laughs> so not only do we get to get our work done, but we also got to um, watch the games and celebrate the emojis. Uh, and congratulations to France, of course. <laughs> Something else new at this meeting, people might have noticed that there's, uh, there have been Chromebooks on the tables for the working group chairs uh, at the front of every session. When the ISG first talked about uh, getting these added, there was a little bit of concern about whether there would be enough space on the tables um, that remained for the working group chairs to, um, to still manage the meetings, and you have the blue sheets, and there's all kinds of stuff up there. But it seems that uh, that wasn't necessarily a problem. And in particular, some of the working group chairs were quite inspired by this and brought a whole family of laptops so that the Chromebook wouldn't be lonely. Um, this particular case, uh, let's see, five, five devices sitting there on the table. Um, big thanks to the Secretariat for providing those. I think, I think that's been a, a well-received change. So getting on with our agenda, um, we'll first thank our host uh, briefly, and then we'll have updates on hot topics from um, all of our different constituencies. So I'll give... Uh, ITF chairs update. Um, Ted will talk about the IAB, or maybe not. I can't remember. We, we crossed you out. You're coming on later. Um, Allison will speak briefly about the IRTF. We'll have administrative hot topics, um, and then we'll hear from the NOMCOM chair. We'll have a section uh, in memoriam. We'll do some recognition. We'll have the Jonathan B. Postel Award from Kathy Brown. And there's no technical plenary tonight, so then we'll go straight into the open mic sessions. So first, and extremely importantly, a huge thanks to our host at this meeting, Juniper. <laughs> Juniper is one of our global hosts, which means they've made a multi-year commitment to support the IETF, host three meetings over the span of uh, nine years. Uh, at support that we really can't function without, so we're extremely appreciative for that. Um, typically we have a host presentation, uh, but Juniper wanted to 
donate that time back to us for the rest of the plenary and wish everybody <laughs> uh, wish everybody a productive meeting. So um, on to the ITF chairs report. I'll cover some typical items, uh, participant statistics for this meeting, a little note about the hot RFC session that we had on Sunday, an update on IASA 2.0, a uh, preview of an agenda experiment we're running at IETF 103, and then just a reminder about respectful behavior at our meetings. So here in Montreal, we have 1,020 people on site. We have 137 first-time attendees, which is a, a pretty typical size group of first-timers. Um, for a summer meeting, if we compare it to the last summer meeting, uh, it's a little bit on the small side. Uh, continuing with a, a trend that we've seen over the last few years. And we had participants from 56 countries this time, pretty on par with, uh, with last summer meeting as well. The, I took, the ITF hackathon took place on Saturday and Sunday. Uh, we set another new attendance record at the hackathon. 227 people showed up in person. I think we had more than 300 registered. Um, 41 people remote, and we had 25 different project teams, so that event continues to just grow and grow. We also did the Hack Demo Happy Hour on Monday night, where teams could present their projects and um, talk to other attendees about what they accomplished on the weekend. Uh, we also had the World Cup streaming at the hackathon, an additional benefit of uh, <laughs> the, the meeting date change. Uh, and some people worked very, very hard, as you can see, while they were watching the game. The next hackathon will take place again on the weekend uh, prior to the working group session starting November 3rd and 4th in Bangkok uh, prior to ITF 103. So please plan your travel accordingly. This is the second meeting where we ran uh, an event on Sunday night called Request for Conversation, Hot RFC. This involves lightning talks to encourage brainstorming, to socialize new ideas, to find collaborators, to advertise uh, bar boffs and side meetings. Took place on Sunday and there were 10 talks. Uh, there was, it was a packed room, there were more than 100 people there. Um, and you can find the proceedings on, on the web. This is something we've done experimentally, it's only the second time, so the IHG is looking for feedback about this, whether people think it's a useful event, um, whether we should keep doing it, what we should change. And a big thanks to Aaron Falk for uh, doing the organization there and um, taking the initiative to plan the event. I also wanted to give an update about the IETF Administrative Support Activity 2.0, which has been a project that's going on, been going on for a couple of years now. Uh, this is the discussion about how we refactor the way that we administer the IETF. The current plan is to create a limited liability corporation, IETF LLC, uh, to house the, the IETF's administration. It will be a legal entity within the Internet Society where we are currently organized as an activity. Uh, on Tuesday, the IASA 2 working group met, and in the room, at least, there was rough consensus about the final uh, big open issue that, that uh, we needed to resolve about related to the LLC's board structure. So the next steps, as that consensus is being confirmed on the list, we're also going to be finalizing the legal documents that are required in order to create this LLC, and those will go out for a last pass uh, to the IETF community. And then the hope is to execute those legal agreements and start getting the LLC set up in August um, prior to the changeover from the current ISOC CEO to the new CEO who's starting in September. So that's the plan for IASA 2.0 as it stands. I wanted to give people a heads up about an experiment with the agenda that we're going to be running at IETF 103. This has been mentioned on uh, various mailing lists, but I wanted to call people's attention to it in case you're planning your travel. At ITF 103, we're going to run working group sessions only from Monday to Thursday. There's not going to be any working groups meeting on Fridays. We are going to have meeting rooms uh, of all different sizes available on Friday for ad hoc meetings, and the IETF network is still going to be available. And you'll be able to sign up for those um, at the same time when we open working group scheduling. So we're trying to do this to see if we can have a little bit more focused time in, in the working groups. We have a lot of working groups who typically request not to meet on Fridays anyway. Um, and we've, we've heard the uh, suggestion that we try to schedule more ad hoc time. 
Friday might not be the best day. We're going to try this. We might try something different uh, in the next go around. Uh, but we thought we would, we would do a little bit of an experimentation. We're definitely looking for, feed, for more feedback. We've gotten a lot of feedback already, uh, which we appreciate. And certainly, once we actually run the experiment, we'll be asking everybody for their feedback. Just wanted to remind everybody about our guidelines for respectful behavior. It always seems weird to me that we have this slide in here on Wednesday when everybody's already been here for three days. So hopefully, I think everybody is already aware of our guidelines for respectful behavior. Um, but we have a number of different documents that outline what our policies are that, um, that govern uh, how we treat each other here in the IETF. Um, so please be cognizant of those. Um, and I think in particular, we're really trying to establish an inclusive and open community. Um, sometimes those two things actually uh, are at odds with each other. But I encourage people to take a look at the, at the documents and um, uh, think about them as you, as you walk around the IETF. We always publish a report in advance of the IETF meeting. So there's a bunch of other topics that are covered in there that give more updates about working groups that have closed and opened, um, notable documents that we've published since the last meeting, and so on. Um, also currently running experiments that we have. Uh, appeals, we've had one appeal since the last IETF meeting, and lots more detail from um, all of the other uh, entities that support the IETF, the IAB, the IOC, the RFC editor, IANA, the NOC, uh, the Secretariat, and also some uh, reporting from the hackathon, so please check that out. We like to use the IETF blog to uh, expound a little bit more about what's going on in the IETF. If you have something that you think is interesting to the outside world and you want to publish it on the blog, uh, please let me know. We're always looking for more content, um, and we would be happy to have more contributions. We are not going to hear from Ted until later. And with that, I will turn it over to Allison Menken for IRTF. I don't have slides this time. If you want to see slides about the IRTF, um, they're in the IRTF Opens um, uh, proceedings. But I wanted to just tell you that we are a growing group. We had a tremendous, we're very grateful to everyone who cooperated with this because we had a, our yearly workshop, which is called the Applied Networking Research Workshop, which is co-sponsored by uh, ACM, ISOC, and IRTF, as well as some corporate sponsors whom we thank gratefully. Um, and we had it on Monday of IETF week for the first time. This was the third of them, and we were asked by the participants to make it during IETF so that researchers could come here and participate and become involved in, in working groups and research groups as well. And um, we'll be interested to hear your feedback those of you who may not have registered for it are not the people who came specifically for it about how that felt to you. But from the point of view of the attendees, it was a great success. It made a huge difference because we knew that the sessions were surrounded by people who were working actively on the deployment of protocols while this research was being aired. And um, that's a very inspiring thing. That's one of the things that inspires people to come to ITF is that there's a chance that their work will be used and deployed. So thank you for that. Um, those proceedings, you can find everything about IRTF at irtf.org. So um, check it out and uh, ask me questions about ANRW. Um, but uh, uh, you'll find a report about the statistics of ANRW and things like that in my, uh, my more detailed report, which I gave to the open meeting. Yeah. Hi, Allison. Uh, Sean Turner. Um, I thought it was great, actually. I really particularly liked the TLS session. I'm uh, glad it didn't conflict with anything. Um, I guess I would say resist the urge to put it on Friday if we're in Bangkok again. Okay? Like, keep yeah. it on a day where it's actually the same with the, the working groups. Yeah. I think that'd be better. Yeah, and, and um, I should also thank the, the magnificent schedulers of, of AMS because we actually worked to avoid scheduling relevant working groups against sessions so that people could drop in and out of the ANRW. And I'm glad that you appreciated that. I'm glad you noticed that. Yeah, it, was, it was very helpful, thank Just you. Good. 
the magnificent schedulers of AMS. <laughs> Anyone else? Yeah, hi, Allison. Aaron Falk here. Um, I, just, it was, I thought the workshop was great. And I want to commend to folks in the audience who weren't there, uh, Sharon Goldberg, the workshop chair's uh, uh, introductory presentation on how to help new people get traction for their proposals in the IETF. It's, uh, I understand it's posted on the proceedings page, and it's a, uh, it's a few slides. And if I run into anybody who's from outside the community who wants to get something going in the IETF, it's the first thing I'm going to show them after the DAO. That's a really good pointer. Thank you. Yeah. OK, then. So next we have administrative hot topics, Glenn Dean and Portia Wensdanley. Good afternoon. Hi. <laughs> so um, I, I am not as nervous as I was the first couple of times that I was up on the stage. Thank goodness. And um, so, along with not being as nervous, uh, I also have. Um, really had a chance to get to work with more people um, in the few months that I've been here and actually get to know people on a different level. And um, of course it takes a lot to make, oops, to make um, these meetings work. And we really appreciate the, um, the efforts of our host and our sponsors and everything that it takes to really um, go out there and get the, um, the, the funds to make the, um, this, the meetings a success for everyone who's coming from so far away. So our global host for IETF 102 is uh, Juniper Network, and we really appreciate. I hope everyone has enjoyed the, um, the venue this time. Um, it has, we, I think it was actually created for IETF because of all the collaborative um, spaces around. It's been a great place. So thank you, Juniper, for your help. We also have um, a lot of um, sponsors in addition to Juniper to um, make sure that we're doing everything we can to make um, your experience work. And I have a couple of notes here. I want to make sure I don't like to think from my head because it's never a good idea. So our silver sponsors, our silver, wait, silver sponsors are Oracle and Akame. Thank you very much. We appreciate your efforts. We also have our bronze sponsor as VeraSign. And um, Connectivity Sponsors is TELUS and Metropics and uh, Open Face. And we um, have two circuits that came in, and I hope um, everything has gone well with your uh, connectivity. Our w welcome reception, again, Juniper Networks. And I'd also like to acknowledge our sister's lunch, and it's Fastly and Comcast and NBC Universal. I um, have not had a chance to attend those um, yet, so hopefully one day I will, and that'll go well tomorrow. And uh, in addition, we would also like to acknowledge everyone who works on the data tracker enhancements and the code sprint. It takes a lot to make sure that we're um, 
enhancing the, uh, the tools to make sure that it, it's working um, well on your behalf. Our hackathon, Juniper, Cisco DevNet, and uh, NBC Universal, thank you very much. And of course, uh, the NOC. Volunteers for the NOC, we have um, everyone who works with Line Speed and Meet Echo bringing the, um, the meeting to uh, participants on a remote level. And now we'd like to um, acknowledge that IETF is going to be in Bangkok in November. Um, we are still, we are actually in negotiations for um, a global host um, for this meeting, um, and hopefully we have some negotiations that are going on for, um, for hosting uh, opportunities. We do have a local host that has been very instrumental in helping us get um, things going there on the ground. Um, TH Nick, we are very um, thankful for everything that they've done. I'd also like to thank Randy Bush for helping me um, connect with our um, with um, our local hosts to make sure that um, we were able to move forward in so many different ways. If uh, you are interested in um, hosting, please see Ken Borden. And uh, Ken, could you please stand up so so people? Thank you. And with that, I thank you very much. Hello. Um, you may notice I'm not Andrew Sullivan. So one of the big changes that happened is Andrew Sullivan, of course, is now the CEO and president uh, as of September 1st uh, of ISOC, and that made him in ineligible to be the IOC chair. So at this meeting, Andrew uh, stepped down from the chair position, but he remains in the IOC. And I was selected as the, uh, the so hello, I'm Glenn Dean, if you don't know me. So the IOC right now is uh, clearly in a keep the lights on mode. Uh, the LLC is underway, uh, being uh, developed and set up. Uh, and eventually when it's in full operation, the IOC will dissolve and be replaced by the LLC. So we are still in business, we're keeping the lights on going, and we're doing what we've always been doing. I'd like to say thank you for Andrew for his time as chair of the IOC, and I'd also like to acknowledge Kathy Brown, who this is her last IOC meeting that she was able to attend. Uh, she'll be retiring and moving on, so thank you both Andrew and Kathy. So one of the big changes that has been going on uh, in the meeting selection process in the last year was the development of the meeting venue criteria. Uh, and there's been a working group that has been meeting now for about a little more than a year. And uh, they've come to closure on that document and it's going through the secretary, or sorry, the RFC publication process currently. Uh, we've taken that document in the IOC and we've updated our meeting process to reflect its requirements. And so if you go to these URLs, you will see the new uh, documented process for how meeting venues are selected and evaluated. Uh, and hopefully it's very clear now and very well documented. So uh, uh, the other thing I'd like to note that uh, we have uh, have a replacement. We, we used to have an old meetings committee that went in the IOC that took care of a lot of the stuff. And with this new change, the new meetings venue review process, we've created a new committee, literally called the Meetings Venue Review Committee, uh, whose job it is to take the uh, venues we are examining and measure them against the criteria that were developed uh, by the working group. So that's a significant change for how meeting spaces are, will be selected going forward. Uh, in addition, we have uh, new meeting dates that are being selected for this period of 2023 through 2028, and they've all been sent out to the list uh, for input. Okay, so here's the, the controversial one, potentially. We warned you a while back that the meeting rates were going to be changing. 
The good news is the early bird fee has not changed. It remains at what it's always been, or what it's been currently. And, uh, but we've made some other changes. So the late fees will increase uh, just before the median, two weeks before the median and at the median, to $1,000 US. And the standard rate, for those who don't claim the early bird fee, will be $875. And I'll show you a chart in a minute that shows the breakdown of when those uh, kick in. So here's basically the layout. And so for the people who are uh, looking at when they can claim the early bird fee, it's going to open seven weeks prior to the meeting is when that registration will open up and you will be able to claim that fee. And so for the upcoming ITF 103, that means that registration will be open no later than August 13th. Two weeks prior to the meeting, up, sorry, up to two weeks prior to the meeting, you can get the standard rate, which is 875. And if you are closer uh, than two weeks, you will pay $1,000. This was the best way we could balance out the, the charging and, and the need for ITF to increase the rates, but give people an option that allow them to maintain the current rates. Um, one point I would really like to make, Thailand is a brand new country, and we have not been to it as the ITF before. So uh, the guidance we'd like to give to every attendee, wherever you're from, even if you've never needed visas before, please take a look at the visa situation for yourself personally and see if you are going to need a visa or not. Uh, now on visas, typically visas require uh, letters of uh, invitation. The process that is now in place going forward is that prior attendees to ITF meetings can request, once we open registration, you'll be able to request a letter of invitation. For attendees who have not been to an ITF meeting in the past, you will have to register and pay your registration fee and then you can request your letter of invitation. If it turns out you are unable to get your in visa through the process. If you can't attend because of the visa issues, we will refund your um, fee. Okay, clear enough? And we're gonna publish all this on the website so it's very clear uh, when we do registration for 103 going forward. Finally, the very detailed report, if you want all the GORP and all the details, they're available here on these links. So stats so far for this meeting. It's actually been a very good, very good meeting. Uh, we are only three fewer than projected attendees. We're at 1,027, which is wonderful. We issued um, we have, uh, remote participants, 442. We issued 221 letters of invitation for visas. The revenue from registrations is 698,665. And sponsorship revenues, 443. $332. It's a bit of good meeting. Looking back, ITF 101 uh, in London, uh, we had 1,211 paid attendees, 85 more than we projected. And I won't read every last number out here. Uh, bottom line, we did pretty well. Um, the revenues total were 1,493,876. Thank you. Thank you, Glenn and Portia. Next we have the NOMCOM, Scott. Hello, IETF community. Do we have, we need some attention. Come on, let's get some energy going here. This is NOMCOM, it's exciting stuff. So, the, uh, so I'm your uh, new NOMCOM chair coming in and so, I have a few slides that I've prepared. So the first slide is to show, not that slide. The first slide is to show that it is actually possible to herd cats. And this is what we're going to be doing for the next uh, six to eight months. And so I'm not going to tell you which, who the cats are or any of that. You can figure that out for yourself. But the, uh, the important thing here is to acknowledge the fact that we have a large number of volunteers that are helping out with this process of electing the next set of leaders for the IETF. I would like all of the voting and non-voting members, if you're in the room, please stand. If you've got your orange dot, wave it proudly. Come on, there's one. There's another one over there, a couple back there. 
So these are the people that I'm going to be relying on heavily. I am a non-voting member, which means all I can do is make sure the cats go in the right boxes. So it is very important to uh, provide feedback and the way that we're going to interact with the community is through our wonderful set of IETF data tracker tools. So if you've never used it, you probably have, but if you've never looked at it, I provided the link to the website and there are some tabs at the top. And so when you're ready to nominate yourself or someone else, you can click on the nominate tab and fill out the forms and then emails will happen and then, you know, magic occurs. And then when we get to the point of having all the nominations and nominees, then you'll be able to provide some feedback and there's going to be some new behavior. So look, you know, keep your eye out for some new behavior and new ways to provide feedback to the NOMCOM this year. Um, if you're looking to see what type of experience we're looking from the community, we will have we have some information there now, but it's based on, well, that, that information is current. There's a couple of places we're still looking for some more details about the experience. And so I'll, uh, I'll point that out in a slide or two. And then uh, there's questionnaires. If you're going to be a nominee, we have a questionnaire that you need to fill out. Those are work in progress. You can see what we did last year. And we're going to continue to do some work on those. So that's some hard work that we're going to be working on soon, like in the next week or two. So here is my proposed timeline. This is published on the NOMCOM main page. The important date here that we really are striving for is the August 16th date. The NOMCOM will be working very diligently to make sure that we have all the job descriptions and the questionnaires and, and our thoughts together to be ready to announce the call for nominations on the 16th of August. Once that thing comes out, we expect a flurry of activity from this community so that we can have a wonderful pool, a set of people that, that we can choose from. Something that's new this year, as you may have heard if you were paying attention to previous conversation uh, tonight, is this uh, LLC board member. So I want the community to start thinking about this because this is not the type of, of position that the non, IETF non-COM has, has asked for in, in the past. And so there's some different characteristics of people that we're looking for. So please take time, provide some consideration, read the background, and really provide uh, the, this non-COM with a, a reasonable, wonderful set of, of candidates for this. So I am going to end, this is my last slide, I'm going to end quoting the famous uh, American philosopher, uh, Fiona Apple, that uh, there are a couple lines. We are an extraordinary community, right? There's a song that she has that says, but he's no good at being uncomfortable, so he can't stop staying exactly the same. She also says, but I'm good at being uncomfortable, so I can't stop changing all the time. What I'm asking this community to do is embrace the uncomfortable. We're going into a world where things are changing. We need to make sure that we think outside the box, think of, think of ways to make the IETF community even better than it is. And so look around the room. This is your community. It's up to you to make it awesome. So help me do that. Thank you. Thank you, Scott, and thank you for your uh, willingness to serve in the role. I know it's a, it's a lot of work. Allison, can I ask you to come on back up? This is, um, most of you may, many of you may not have known Bob Braden, which seems almost impossible to me, um, because for the first 25 years of the IETF, you would not have been able to not know Bob Braden. Um, 
but if you do remember him, if you're, you know, since we have this nice growth and lots of newcomers, you probably remember him as the person who took over the RFC editor after the death of John Postel in 1998 and served in that role with Joyce Reynolds for uh, many years. Uh, Joyce is also gone now and also very much missed. Um, the people who remember Bob, working with Bob will remember uh, his, his uh, work on the end-to-end -end task force and then research group, RSVP. Maybe some of you remember that he was a fierce advocate for the earliest days of internet multimedia. Um, when, so this is the this start is to just talk about him technically because we are a technical body. He bridged us from the days when there were lots of task forces, end-to-end -end task force and IETF were parallel organizations in those days, to a time that, that we, most of us don't even know all the different things that we owe Bob for in terms of technology and, and things that we take, ser that we, uh, take for granted now. Um, but then the other thing is that the other night, a group of us who had known him well met together with his two sons and with two nieces of his who came here because IETF was such an important part of Bob's life and reminisced about him. And I just want to say very briefly that everybody who spoke spoke of his humor, that it was acute and mostly gentle. Um, and they spoke of his genuine and warm willingness to teach. He was never a professor, but he was always a teacher here at IETF. And many of us who have been in the ITF for a long time owe a great deal to the way that Bob taught newcomers and, and helped people to become knowledgeable about the whole of our internet architecture. Um, and then finally, people kept mentioning his great dedication. He was supremely dedicated to the internet and to the IETF. Um, and carried out kind of heroic efforts on the part of us that we still use full standards such as the host requirement standard that required just heroism on his part to pull off. Um, and he's, he, uh, uh, he uh, is being memorialized here because of that tremendous and, and formative role that he played in, in, in our organization and our technology. I don't know if anyone else wants to say a few words about Bob, but. That may not be working, maybe come to the next one up. Um, Philip Prindeville, I remember um, being on my second job out of college, 25 years old, working for Wellfleet as a contractor on basic security options yeah. and ripping my hair out about the ambiguities of precedence of the options and what options invalidate others if they're before or after and so forth. And um, Bob was extremely patient with me, walking me through the logic of how everything worked and giving me great insight in what wasn't stated in the RFC. And um, I don't think it's a stretch to say that I wouldn't be here today if it hadn't been for him. Thank you. And also, welcome back. Yeah, it's been... Uh, 30 years and one week since my last IETF, so. <laughs> Bob Moskowitz, we have a model you see in our science here that IETF making the internet work better. When I think of Bob Braddon, I think IETF making the internet work. With dedication and humor. Thank you. Okay, we're going to move on to the Postel Award.
Thank you. It's my uh, great pleasure <clears throat> on behalf of the Internet Society to present the 2018 Jonathan B. Postel Award. Uh, John Postel, the first editor of the RFC series, the first director of IANA, and the first member of the Internet Society, 1992. The Jonathan B. Postel Award <clears throat> was established by the Internet Society to honor individuals or organizations that, like John Postel, have made outstanding contributions and service to the data communications community. Since his death and his, the, the award of uh, the first award in 1999, nine, uh, 15, 17 times this award has been given to esteemed members of this community. I myself have had the amazing privilege of doing the last four, and now the final time I do this, the fifth. What is very special about this award, it is a peer award. So the prior uh, winners of the award uh, are picking the next person who is Stephen G. Hooter. For his leadership and personal contributions at the Network Startup Resources Center that enabled countless others to develop the internet in more than 120 countries, this year you are the winner of this very special award. Which is stuck in customs, so we will take, we will take the picture. <laughs> Let me just see. Thank you, Kathy. Uh, so, thank you. Thank you very much. So when I first uh, got your message a couple months ago, Kathy, I was scrolling through morning email and I read it and then I decided to have a few more sips of coffee and read it again to make sure it wasn't spam. Um, and then I, you know, kind of flashed back and I thought, 1996, Montreal. And the last time I was here was the the joint INET uh, IETF meeting that was here in Montreal. And I was one of the volunteer uh, ISOC folks helping out with the INET workshops. And, and there I made friends with, with a guy named Adiel Aklogan. Many of you know him. He, uh, he was, came from Lomé, Togo for the workshop. And you know, we were, when it was over, we went to the IETF meeting to go you know, check that out. And we were riding on an escalator. And he said, hey, man, how do I, how do I get this .tg? You know, my country code, you know, top level domain isn't delegated yet. And in a great moment of serendipity, John was coming up the escalator as we were going down. And I just said, see that guy with the long gray beard? We need to talk to him. And, you know, I said, John, could you wait for us at the top? And he said, sure. And so we rode up and, you know, Adiel introduced himself, posed his question. And John chatted with him for a few minutes and, and said, uh, you know, you know the drill, get the name servers up and fill out the template and send it in. And Adia worked with actually a guy from, from Quebec here from Montreal, Francois Normand, who uh, assisted him with getting all that going. And a few days later, you know, .tg was on the net. And so I kind of thought back to how, how in a way, nice and simple, you know, things were, things were back then. And it gave me a nice time to reflect about that experience with John. Um, I'm happy to receive this award, you know, on behalf of the Network Startup Resource Center, and I feel strongly that it, it really should be a group award because there are a lot of people that contribute to this from, you know, folks at the University of Oregon to international contractors and dozens and dozens of volunteers, some of whom are in this room. But, you know, when I first started working with it in 1993, quite some time ago, um, you know, it already had roots well before that, and, and the, the original, you know, vision and uh, inspiration and, frankly, sweat was all Randy Bush. Randy had started in the late 80s assisting folks in South Africa with establishing some of their first connections to research institutions, universities, and that led over to the neighbors wanting to use CP email feed in Namibia and Botswana, Zambia, Zimbabwe, etc. 
And it led to this amazing set of stepping stones that, that really helped several dozen countries with some of their first TCP IP connections. And so, uh, 1992, uh, Randy teamed up with John Clemson, who was at MIT at the time, and he was working with a United Nations University project under the International Nutrition Foundation. And they were trying to get email connections in a bunch of countries so folks could basically do nutrition education with people in their countries about this. So they wrote a grant to the National Science Foundation to formalize what they were doing, and that's really the roots of it. And, and in another great moment of serendipity, there was a guy named Steve Goldstein, some of you may know him, and, and he happened to be appointed as the international interagency networking coordinator about this time, and really needed to start internationalizing the NSF net and getting connections into countries where US scientists were being funded to do you know, paleontological research in Mongolia and geophysics research in the Rift Valley and all sorts of things like that. So several other people got involved and Randy was awesome at you know, recruiting people for the INET training workshops and, and then starting to cultivate network operator groups and always infusing a spirit of cultivating network operators helping each other. And that's really the essence of how the NSRC still operates today. And you know, we've evolved the model and techniques to, to today's internet to do the training and things are virtualized and all sorts of other, other advancements. But, but the heart and spirit still really go back to, to the roots that, that I learned and we all learned uh, from Randy and, and John. And John Postel was a close peer of theirs. I was fortunate to meet him by association with Randy and John, and I'm really grateful to, to receive this today. So thank you, uh, ISOC, thank you, IETF, uh, thank you, University of Oregon, and various other few dozen sponsors, particularly NSF and Google, that have been steadfast over the years. And, and thanks to all of you that contribute to the work of the NSRC and helping advance the net in new places. Thank you. So um, next we have a, somebody special to recognize. You thought you were going to get off the stage, Kathy, but you're going to have to come on back up. Not just yet. You can wait. I'll give you a little break. So I knew of Kathy before I knew Kathy. Going back to her days as a, uh, in government and at Verizon working on telecom policy, um, my father also was working on telecom policy not always on the same side as Kathy. Often, almost never on the same side as Kathy from what I could gather from, uh, from, from the, my family lore. But I think the way that Kathy would, would characterize him, and actually she just did this the other day, was that she would say, I love him for it. And that's really the spirit that Kathy, that I've seen Kathy bring to her, to her role at ISOC and um, her role in the internet community. When I did get to work with her starting in the IANA transition process uh, several years ago. Um, that was always the mentality that she brought. Even if we have opposing views, different parts, different constituencies, she was always striving to see what are the commonalities, get us to focus on our common goals and what we're trying to achieve together. Uh, even if she disagreed with you, she loved you for it. And given the success of that transition process, we are all the um, beneficiaries of her leadership and strategic vision uh, in that process. Even closer to home, Kathy has been uh, really integral to our ability to carry out the IASA 2.0 process thus far and on a, a really short timeline uh, for, some, for a project this complex. She has really combined an openness of mind to allow the IETF community to explore all different avenues of what it is that we might want to do uh, as an organization, as a community, while also at the same time um, constantly reaffirming ISOC's support for the IETF and the desire to provide whatever it is that we need in order to succeed and continue to make the internet work better. And for that, I'm very grateful and I think, uh, I think we all are. So 
thank you so much, Kathy, for all of your contributions as ISOC president and CEO. And um, we do have a few gifts for you if you want to come on up on stage. We have the traditional plaque. <laughs> You've given a lot of these plaques, so we got you a plaque. <laughs> Thank you for the plaque. <laughs> Also, of course, it's not the real plaque. We're going to send you the real plaque. <laughs> There's never a real plaque. <laughs> so, um, we know that, um, unlike some folks in our community whose retirement involves sending many, many emails uh, on mailing lists, your retirement sounds like it's going to involve potentially staring at the ocean. Yes. <laughs> and we wouldn't want you to forget about us while you're staring at the ocean. <laughs> so we got you an IETF emblazoned beach towel. Um, again, not the real towel. <laughs> the real towel <laughs> is coming. <laughs> but we'll send it to you. <laughs> OK, thank you for having me. Oh, yeah, of course. Um, Thank you. This is a bit of a surprise. Um, it's, um, it's been an experience, an honor, and um, a, a privilege to be part of this community, to um, be part of the Internet Society. <clears throat> the work you do, the work the Internet Society does, is crucial uh, to, the, to the evolution of the Internet, to its uh, continued opportunities that it provides for the people of the world. And so it is um, with um, great appreciation that I appreciate this towel. I now intend <laughs> to look at the ocean and figure out what it all means. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Next up, we have the IAB open mic. So if the IAB could come up to the stage, please. So while the rest of the IEB is assembling, I must note that tonight uh, one of our colleagues, uh, Christian Wietema, uh, was unable to join us because of a death in his family. Our thoughts are with him and his wife as they have returned to France uh, to deal with the situation. Uh, as is traditional, we'll start with introductions. Gabriel, why don't you start? Gabriel Montenegro. Suzanne, Suzanne Wolf. Eric, <clears throat> Eric Nordmark. Allison Mankin. Robert Sparks. Jeff Tensura. Alyssa Cooper. Ted Hardy. Martin Thompson. Melinda Shore. Yari Ark. Mark Nottingham. Brian Trammell. Heather Flanagan, RFC editor. The mic lines are open. I totally don't believe you. <laughs> You're really hoping I'm going to sing the Zero Mostel version of comedy tonight, aren't you? <laughs> well, I'm certainly not going to sing it. <laughs> Barry Leba. Okay, Heather. Thank you, Barry. What are you planning to do about the RFC series? <laughs> Why, thank you for asking, Barry. <laughs> I have a list. <laughs> it's rather long. Um, first, uh, some of you might have heard that we're working on changing the RFC format. Is this, is this a shock to anyone in this room? Wait, I, I saw a hand. 
Okay, uh, what, there's two. Uh, I don't believe you. Um, yeah, so this is a project we've been working on for quite some time. Um, the good news is that we are in the uh, phase that the RFC Production Center is actively testing the tools. Um, so it's, it's moved from, you know, a, a gleam in my eye to actual code that we're trying to make sure is running. Um, once we have it to a state that it works for the production center, then we're going to be reaching out to the community and asking you all to be testing it as well to make sure it works for you. Uh, at this point, I'm expecting that to happen around the next meeting. Um, things have taken a little bit longer than, than I had certainly hoped, but uh, progress is being made just slow and steady. So there's that. Uh, other projects, however, are on my list, um, some of which are a little bit, um, I would call edgy. There's things I want to try and do, like uh, when we have um, RFCs that are actual proper HTML with a CSS, wouldn't it be really interesting to have a sandbox place to say, well, what else can we do with this? Uh, can we actually annotate these with some of the errata? Would that cause problems? in terms of the, the where people reference the archival version of a document, I don't know. This is something I want to explore. There's a lot I can do with the metadata in documents that can be improved. Um, and that can do, that. doing that has an add-on effect of making the documents much more easily, easily indexed in other organizations, uh, sites, and services. Um, and to be very, very clear, I should have put this in my email to the, to the IETF list earlier. All of this is all, all well and good, but frankly, the first priority, the priority that comes before, before all of this is to publish documents. Uh, if any of the projects that I come up with um, look like they're going to impact uh, the rate of publication, it's something I do with a lot of consultation and otherwise the projects have to wait because we want to get your documents out the door. That's the most important thing that the RFC editor does. So uh, that's, that's the short, short version. Aaron, I believe you're next. Hi, Aaron Falk. Um, on the same topic, or same general topic. Um, uh, so there's a, a few questions here, uh, some information, uh, mostly trying to get some information. So, I used to, way back, I used to be part of the RFC editor. I'm currently part of something called the RFC editorial board. Um, there's another group called the um, RFC series oversight committee, which my understanding is uh, is a support group serving at the pleasure of the IB. I was wondering if you could maybe talk a little bit about the relationship between that group and the IB, how the IB uses them maybe a little bit about their involvement in uh, the BOF last night was something I didn't see come up on the list or in the BOF. And I understand that the entire group is being, uh, is up for potential replacement. And I was wondering if you could sort of talk a little bit about, well, first, is that true? And if so, why? Thanks. Uh, so the RFC Series Oversight Committee is actually an IEB program. Uh, it's set out in one of the RFCs, the number of which I am looking up frantically, um, or actually, uh, Alyssa Every is RFC. finally going to look up for me. 6635. Okay, so uh, during the whole, um, we're looking at the number. Uh, like many other programs, it's part of how the uh, IEB maintains long-term commitments uh, that may continue past the lifetime of any single IEB member. Uh, so the whole program effort there uh, has been put in place to make sure that the IEB can keep attention to something uh, over a longer period of time than the lifetime of any single member or chair. Um, and in this particular case, uh, the, the RFC sets out that the RSOC will be um, part of the oversight of the RFC series. Um, Sorry, Phil, do you have a clarifying question or are you just standing up for later? Okay. Um, so uh, the RSOC is in fact at this point, um, we, we have put out a call for volunteers and there are interviews going on this week, some of them have happened already, uh, for new volunteers or uh, continuing members of RSOC. Um, and it's actually pretty typical. You'll see that the IEB calls for volunteers all the time for different things. 
um, and the appointment process will go forward um, after we've had the completion of the uh, call for volunteer, uh, after we've had the interviews and after we've collated the inf information from the interviews um, with the uh, public information that we got from putting out a call for um, comments. And about the boss. Oh, sorry, Robert, did you want to, to talk about RSOC a little bit more? Um, he'll continue to talk about RSOC and then I'll talk about the boss. So the defining documents for RSOC talk about the reason for having it as a separate body. The IB manages it as a program because it manages many other things like a program, but it is a little bit more than a program in the way that it's defined. When we set out the call for um, the um, people to volunteer to serve on the RSOC, um, we realized it had been quite a long time since we had done a serious evaluation of everyone that was on the RSOC and the IAB decided that we would just reevaluate everyone who was willing to continue. At the time the IAB made that decision, um, everyone was fully cognizant that one of the major reasons for having RSOC as a separate body was for um, continuity of information, that it was expected to be a relatively stable body of people. Um, so if there were, is concern that this was a clear the slate and put a new set of people in um, uh, kind of uh, uh, intended activity, it's certainly not the case at all. It is more um, exercising the responsibility that the IAB has for um, overseeing the RSOC itself and making sure that we're doing the right thing. So on the topic, are there any, sorry, sorry. Are there any terms or mechanisms that uh, in, ensure some sort of uh, continuity, or are you just guys? You no, just there is. There, there are no terms. Um, the document that that created RSOC has the principles that um, define how the IB should manage its constituency, and the IAB is very much aware of what those principles are. So the RFC in question is RFC 6635, as somebody mumbled earlier but has been confirmed since then. My apologies for not having it on the tip of my tongue. Uh, on the question of the BOF, as you may have seen from the message the IAB sent out earlier today, uh, one of the issues there is we did not do some of the coordination that we would have normally done in a timely fashion, and indeed there was not a coordination with the RSOC in advance. Um, so some of that uh, is certainly one of the things we feel like we did wrong about that, and we apologize. So, so in, a, in a perfect world, uh, sort of rolling back the clock, do you think that the IB talking to the RSOC and the RSOC talking to the RSC is a reasonable path for um, how the concern that motivated the BOF could have been expressed? I'm, I'm trying to understand sort of the role of where this group fits. I mean, if the, the IB is going to go off and do things on their own, then what does this group do? And, so I think, that, I, I think that there is a distinction here that, that's important to draw, right? Uh, the RSOC and the RSE and uh, the editorial board all do things that are um, very, very important, but primarily relate to how the RFC series is now. Now, there's a role that the RSE plays in thinking about the evolution of the RFC series, sorry, the RSE plays in thinking about how the evolution of the RFC series is. But there's also a role for the whole community to think about it. As I, I noted, this particular problem has been called to the fore by the IAB in the past. There have also been other suggestions for changes to the RFC series, for example, the best current operational practices effort that was discussed some time ago that came from external uh, bodies to the IETF. So I don't think there's a limitation in who can suggest changes to the series, but there's a very important principle that those discussions need to be public. And I think that the the problem that we ran into here is in trying to pay attention to that principle and making the discussions public, uh, some of the external coordination that should have happened before that public discussion didn't occur. Thank you. Okay, so uh, I have Phil next, and then I believe I have that microphone, and then Bob, and then back to that microphone. Uh, this is possibly a question, well, actually it's a question for the ISG and the AIB. When you're looking at the RFC series, I think that part of the problem is that we have this frame of how do we fix RFCs? And it might well be that what we need is something that's a little bit between an internet draft and an RFC. Because many times, all the people are coming to the IETF and asking for an RFC 
is simply to have something that is permanent and can be referenced elsewhere. Now, we've given up the principle that drafts expire and disappear. They're now persistent, and that's great for me as a patent expert witness because it's my prior art sources. Uh, I think that maybe rather than trying to reform RFCs and solve the problem in that frame, it may be that you need something in between, something that's a little, a little bit less than an RFC. And maybe what we need to do is to work out, you know, are the drafts something that the ISG should be doing? Should be, they be happening with the RFC? But at least they need to be considered together because you've got two publishing streams here and you need to think about where the best place is rather than choose one or the other. Heather, did you want to answer that? I think it's an interesting idea. It's something I'll want to explore. I'm, my gut reaction is a bit of hesitancy of, um, I mean, one of, the, one of the things we had as feedback the other night is uh, dividing RFCs into a host of other things means you have, you have a brand to build and you've got confusion that you're introducing to solve other confusion. How you handle that can be really delicate, so I'm, it, it makes me anxious to, to consider how we're going to do it. It's not a no, it's a, we have to be careful if we go that route. Richard? Hi, Richard Barnes. Um, uh, quick comment on the, on the question for you folks. Robert, I wanted to react real briefly to a phrase you used, which was continuity of information. Um, I, I realize that can be, that can seem like a motivation to keep a lot of stability in a, in a, in a governing board. But the contrary, you know, what, what that makes me worry about is stagnation and a lack of new blood, in, you know, it's, which is a constant problem across a lot of groups that we have around this organization. And so I encourage you to keep, you know, the, the IEB, to keep in mind that flow to get new ideas and new blood into these, these oversight bodies you're appointing, in addition to maintaining continuity. In fact, having regular turnover can be a, bit, a way to maintain continuity because you establish processes around it and you're not reliant on, you know, fallible individuals for maintaining continuity. So that's, that's my little rant. The question I'd like to propose to, to, pose to the folks, uh, I mean, multi-stakeholderism is, you know, a, a thing that, that we're kind of keen on around here in the sense of making sure that all the people who are affected and have a stake in a decision are represented in making that decision. Um, and so I'm curious what Heather and the members of the IAB involved with the, with the RFC series think, who, what you guys think is the set of stakeholders for the RFC series and how you're pulling in relevant feedback from that whole collection of stakeholders in deciding how this RFC series evolves. Uh, Heather, and then I think I'll answer as well. Um, one of the things that, it, it, frankly, I want to talk to just about anyone that can spell RFC, um, if they're technical enough to, to know anything about that or, or incorporate that. Um, I don't know if folks, if folks realize that I'm not full-time doing RFC series editor. I actually work with um, scholarly publishers. I work with National Research and Education Networks. I do a lot in the identity and access management space. Um, I have a lot of contacts with some of the network operator groups around the world uh, through the ITF. I have contacts with a lot of the corporate entities that use RFCs and I have no shame in leveraging all of those things to get the information I need. Um, and I let in turn, I will come back to this community as sort of the heart of it all to say, here's who, I, here's the type of group I've been talking to. Am I missing anybody? Uh, I've already gotten some really excellent feedback about uh, reaching out to open source communities, which I think is brilliant, um, as well as uh, talking to RIPE and a few others. So open to pretty much anything. The, the one thing I would like to add to that is that there are really two classes of stakeholders here, and that's the, the people who are producing RFCs and the people who are consuming them. And it's much easier for us to reach out to the people who are producing them. We're connected to every single one of the streams here. And one of the reasons that we like to hold meetings, such as the one that was held earlier, at, uh, at ITFs is because you have ITF, IRTF, ISE, um, and IEB. All of the stream managers are together at one time. And, and that can be a failing, right? It's very easy for us to look at the production side of that. And it's extremely difficult to pull in um, who may be 
um, the consumers of these RFCs. And as a stakeholder community, uh, that does require some outreach uh, that um, Heather is going to be taking on, um, but that is very general and we could use your help as a community with. I think uh, one of the things she just mentioned, for example, was that Adam had suggested that the open source community might be one as a consumer of RFCs for which we don't have great data and they're going to try and work together to get some additional data on that set of consumers, uh, even though they're very rarely producers of RFCs. And uh, certainly there are other members of the community who have other ideas for how we can do outreach to the set of um, stakeholders from that side of the equation. It would be very valuable. Thanks. I, I, I'm glad that that's something that's on y'all's minds, and I encourage you to keep that in mind. The, the, the only addition I would note on top of that is that given that I think this, this consumer stakeholder group is the entire internet technical community in numbers and millions, it's going to be difficult to take kind of an artisanal, I go talk to people approach, or someone goes and talks to people approach. And so I, I think I would encourage you to take some innovation in uh, you know, collecting data in different mm -hmm. ways to, to try and bring in broader category responses. Couldn't agree more. Uh, one of the me meetings I'm having this week is with um, some of the folks who do communications and marketing at the Internet Society to figure out if, if I was going to do something like a survey, uh, how, how does one do that? Uh, how do they do their outreach? What's that going to look like? Could I, could I potentially leverage some of the ISOC regions? Or, you know, it's, it's just a very initial exploration, but I think you're right. I, as much as I apparently try to, I can't talk to everybody. <laughs> I talk to a lot of people, but not everybody. So, yes, it's a good, well-taken point. Bob, I think you're next. Thank you. Um, so I'm Bob Hinden. I've been involved in different degrees with the RF series, RFC series since, you know, I worked with John Postel and all the RFC editors since and written a few RFCs and so forth. So I appreciate the, I'll call it, apology you sent to the RFC plus, the ITEP list about this. But I would sort of like to chastise the IB for the what you did here. The, you know, so if I'm going to read from, you know, RFC 6635, which defines this, section 2.1, RFC editor. The RFC series editor is the individual with overall responsibility for the quality, continuity, and evolution of the RFC series. This activity should have been directed to the RFC editor. The IEB should not have taken it on. It doesn't say the IEB is responsible here for, these, for the evolution and these things. So I think you've seriously overstepped your responsibility here. And, and so I think your, in some sense, your apology didn't go far enough because it didn't get the impression that you um, sort of were willing to take it back. It was more of you just didn't follow the right procedure. But I think this should have just gone, you should have asked the RFC editor to, to look at this issue and come, you know, consult with the community and come back with a recommendation. You shouldn't have done a BOF. The IESG shouldn't have approved it. It appears that you did this in a rush. So the IEB, which is supposed to be the deliberative body, who says they're very busy, decided to take this on themselves. I, I think, you know, I think you've made a serious mistake here. And um, so I hope you um, take, this in, take this to heart and next time or some other issue, you figure out what the right thing to do is. But it, this, this was not a very good performance. Leslie, I think you're next. Thanks, uh, Leslie Daigle, and I think my remarks are probably going to put some context around some of Bob's. Um, and, and also, maybe some of my remarks would have fit in a little bit in the in-memoriam section, because it occurs to me that there's some stuff that this community to do well, to remember, and probably if you didn't know Bob Braden, then you probably don't remember this part of the RFC series history, namely that for a number of years, up until about a dozen years ago, um, it was published out of ISI. It was funded by ISOC. It was funded by ISOC even before there was an IASA. Um, it was funded as a separate activity. So as part of the administ administrative restructuring that we did the last time around, um, it was time for that part of our universe to move on um, and become 
under the same umbrella as the other activities administratively. But um, at the time, it was it, the RFC editor was a very independent beast. It was an academic function hosted at ISI, like I said. And when we were in discussions, and I can remember which airport I was striding around having those discussions with the head of ISI at the time, uh, to move the function into something that was closer to the IETF administration, there was a lot of concern over how to make sure this remained true to the spirit of the RFC series. So how could it maintain its support for the independent activities that it published? Because the IETF does not, the IEB does not look after the RFC series for the IETF. The IEB looks after the RFC series for the internet community. So it's broader. And so even having a boff here to talk about stuff is very, very focused. It's, it's you know, as Richard outlined, there's m many more people to reach out to, so on and so forth. But another piece of that puzzle was how could we make sure that the RFC series editor was adequately supported with a broad base of people who were familiar with both technical publishing and uh, the internet publishing space, and hence the RSOC. To be, the RSOC was constituted not just to be another IEB program. The RSOC is an IEB program simply because that was the mechanism that fit the bill. But the purpose of the RSOC was to be that collection of independent advisors. Um, for the independent RFC series editor. So I think it's great for any committee, it's absolutely great to review them periodically, review the composition, you know, adjust the, the mandate if necessary. Um, but it isn't just that this is an IAB thing to, you know, update and, and twiddle with a, you know, a boff on a Monday night. Um, this is larger than the IETF. It has to be handled with the broad perspective that the IEB has, which goes beyond the IETF. Um, and it has a rich history all of its own. So um, Bob referenced the RFC that details the mechanics of how this got brought into the, uh, the IETF space. But there's a lot of rich history out there uh, about the, the background of the RFC series that um, people in this room sure, certainly should make themselves aware of. Um, and I think that maybe there's a little bit more reading for the IAB to do before um, making more operational choices and discussions going forward. Thanks. So just to point out two quick clarifying things, the independent series editor also has an editorial board called the ISEB, which I believe Aaron referenced earlier, uh, which does editorial advice to them. Uh, that's a, distinct from the RSOC. Both are, of course, available. Uh, to advise both the independent series editor, where RSOC is more for the RSE. Uh, the other thing I'll point out here is that one of the issues that I think that the IAB was thinking about here was evolution, and not just evolution for the IETF, but in particular for the IRTF and for some of the other streams. It was very clear in the BOF on Monday that that particular concern uh, was not well expressed, and we certainly apologize for it, but the, the evolution of the streams and the evolution of the output of the bodies that are both present here as producers um, is certainly something that we continue to look at beyond just the IETF. As we said, we're also going to be looking much harder at working out how we can look at the consumption side of the stakeholder body, but the, the simple fact is the, the movement into four streams has started but not completed a change in how um, the production works. And we have to think as a community, not just the IETF, but as a technical community on whether it's best to push that change forward, let it evolve on its own, um, or make sure that the change is limited in order to keep all of them together. And that's the conversation we think uh, Heather will be having as she goes out and uh, starts the rest of this process. So just, just to close on that, that sounds like an excellent conversation to have. Um, it's certainly not the one that I got out of the BOF description. So I hope you've gotten a lot of useful pointers here about what prepar preparatory materials everybody participating in that conversation should have read before engaging in it. We have a list of RFCs and so on, um, and some thoughts about where to have it. Thanks. Thanks, and of course, suggestions on both of those are welcome. Uh, I believe Andrew is next, and then Lucy. Uh, hi, my name is Andrew Sullivan, and I um, wanted to say thank you to the IAB and to the IESG for approving this BOF. 
I thought it was useful. And the reason I think that is not because it was perfect and not because that conversation has completed or the right result has come out or anything like that, but rather because this is the sort of thing that people sometimes go off into you know, rooms and talk amongst themselves and don't talk about in public. And I think that you know, this is a large community and there's a lot of different ways that people can express themselves and so on. And, and, and this is a way that we can get out amongst ourselves and say, look, here are the people who are producing these things and we need to talk to each other about you know, what those issues are and so on. Now this is gonna be a fraught topic. It's gonna be one that creates a lot of you know, strong feelings and there's a lot of history and different people have different views about this. But I think that it's good that we, you know, we came together. It was like another plenary, right? Because it was, there was nothing else against it. And I think that that's a, that's a, a fine thing to do. Um, you know, I, I, I can understand that there are people who, who don't feel that it was executed perfectly or whatever. I, uh, myself, having executed a few things in, in public, not always very well, um, understand that, you know, sometimes you're, you're going to have a little bit of trouble. But, you know, I, I still think it took a, a certain amount of uh, uh, a bravery on your part to say, hey, we're going to talk about this and we're going to talk about it in public here among the people who have to, um, uh, who, who, who do this work. And, and it's definitely going to be a delicate topic. So I, I really appreciate it and I wanted to thank you. Lucy, you're next. I'll point out some of the people who were affected since there are multiple streams. But uh, I, I actually want to change the topic slightly. Several people have referenced transparency and engaging the community in conversation and whatever. And I'm, I'm a person who likes people to show their work. That's part of why I like the drafts. That's part of why I like the archival part of the RFC series. I would like the IAB to publish their agendas and to open their calls in the same way that the IESG does. Okay, uh, we'll take that under advisement and get back to you. Uh, certainly all of the minutes are public. Um, I don't know that we've ever published the agendas. I'd have to, right. the to look back. the minutes are public. They're after the fact. So things like these conversations, what it says about the, this particular bot is you went into executive session. And I will point out a good bit of this actually also occurred at the retreat with uh, the IB and the ISG, and those minutes are not public either. So uh, I take your point. So I'm sorry I can't see you very well, uh, but there is somebody at the back mic. Oh, sorry, uh, I didn't see you at all, apparently. Because I'm short. Um, I'm Ann Bennett. Um, in view of the negative feelings that were raised around the RFC++ BOF, if I have comments on the very interesting topics that were raised on that BOF, is it appropriate to post them to the RFC++ mailing list, or is there some better forum for this discussion? The RFC++ mailing list has been closed, so that's, you're not going to be able to post anything there anymore. Uh, the, after the, the posting of the minutes, I closed the list um, since the BOF process is over, and um, Heather, I think, has... Has requested uh, that they happen on the RFC yeah. interest list, which is a much longer running list. Sorry, repeat that mailing list? Uh, it's the RFC interest mailing list. Thank you. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, if somebody could yeah. write it down for you. Uh, Heather? Um, and just as a side note, for folks who would rather drink bleach than listen to format conversation, <laughs> I, I think there might be some of you. Um, I'm trying to focus the RFC interest list on, on discussion topics and whatnot. Now that we're moving to looking at actual tools and testing tools and whatnot, there is an XML to RFC dash dev list. Um, and I expect a lot more of the uh, operational format work discussions to uh, happen there when we're ready to release the tools for user testing. So keep that in mind. Speaking personally, I have to know what flavor of bleach before you tell me it's going to be a format issue. Um, and I think, Lemon. I think you were first before Shane. And I'm sorry, I can't see you because there's a light shining right at me from right there. Sure. Um, Philip Prindeville again. Um, so I, I attended the uh, ANRW. I, I think that was the first time that they were here. As somebody who dabbles in security without trying to make too much of a fool of himself since everything has security implications these days anyway. 
Um, I appreciated having the ac academics present who will then study my work and then tell me where I went wrong afterwards, or possibly even during these meetings so that I'm spared that embarrassment. So um, I, is that going to be a regular thing, the NRW, Allison? Uh, yeah, so the, um, it's, it's the, that was our third iteration, but it was our first time where we had it during the IETF week instead of the weekend before. And that was the inspired idea of, of the program chairs that they wanted to make sure that we actually brought it together with the community here at the IETF. Um, so we, we actually already have the logo for ANRW 2019 ready to go. And we're pl making plans to get the next one going in, in um, the near term. Will they be concurrent? Yeah. Excellent. Thank yeah. you. So, yeah, come again next year. IETFers, too. It it'll be here in Montreal again, too. So, <laughs> A lot of local knowledge will serve you again well. Jane. Hi, my name is Shane Kerr. I, I apologize that this is the wrong forum, and I'll sit down and please don't yell at me. Um, but I've been to a lot of side meetings this week, which were held in the venue, like with groups of 30 or 40 people um, discussing topics that were highly relevant to some of the working groups that are going on. And I noticed a trend towards this over the past few years that we start to have meetings that don't have minutes or agendas or any way for remote people to participate that are happening in sort of semi-formal ways in the IETF. And we have a kind of, it, there's, there's pushback with BOFs because you can only have two for a specific, oh, I'm sorry, am I, am I in the wrong place? No, you're, you're actually pro providing an excellent segue because your question is for the ISG. So I'm gonna ask them oh. to come up to the stage. <laughs> Ask the IAB to step down, and you can continue with your question as they do. Great. Thank you. <laughs> yes. I'm just showing my ignorance of how the IETF actually works. So. Yeah, so anyway, well, that, that's basically it. I know with, with BOFs, there's a restriction. You can only have two BOFs for some reason. Um, so I know within certain people that have interest in topics, they're kind of afraid to have a boff because they don't want to waste their boffs. So that's where bar boffs became kind of a thing. But now you have to register a bar boff. So people have things that they don't know what to call these meetings because they're not allowed to call them anything. <laughs> so I guess what, what I would like to see is someone who doesn't come to every ITF, but when I'm here, likes to participate, is that I think it should be easier to have some sort of official gathering here that doesn't run into all these issues about what do we call it, how do we record it, who's allowed to know about it, and these kind of things. Anyway, that, that's basically my, my observation and, I guess, concern. Thank you. So we're going to do a quick round of introductions, and then we'll take your question first. <laughs> um, we have two members of the IESG who were not able to make it to this uh, the meeting this week. Uh, Suresh Krishnan, the internet area director, had a death in his family. And um, Spencer Dawkins is out with a family medical emergency as well. So uh, Spencer may be on remote participation. Uh, and we have, we have their photos here so people know what they look like in any event. And we'll start with introductions with Adam. Adam Roach, uh, Art Area Director. Alvaro Retana, Routing Area. Martin Vigo, Routing Area. Ignaz Bogdanos, Operations and Management. Warren Kamari, also Ops and Management. Ben Campbell, Art Area. Alyssa Cooper, General Area. Mia Kulivin, Transport. Ted Hardy, IAB Chair. Benjamin Kadak, Security Area Director. Terry Manderson, Internet Area Director. Oh, and right here is Shiresh. Deborah Burngard, Routing. Eric Piscuola, Security. Alexei Melnikov, Applications in Real Time. Okay, so to your question, Shane, um, I have just a few thoughts and then I'm sure lots of others will want to chime in. Um, so this is a topic that uh, uh, I know we've been wrestling with as long as I've been on the ISG, and, and uh, it's probably been much longer than that. 
um, to try to bring some clarity to uh, you know, what is considered an official meeting and when does the note well apply and all of these things. What we've done recently as the ISG to, to try and facilitate that um, is we've created these side meeting rooms, sort of specifically for side meetings, and they explicitly do not have remote participation capability. Um, they don't have projectors. The, I the idea of them is to uh, facilitate an uh, ad hoc discussion, uh, you know, a, a closer interaction between a smaller group of people than what you would normally get uh, with a boff, with microphones and presentations and slide decks and so on. Um, and they have, we have this sign-up procedure for them. Um, they open up at a certain time before the, the meeting starts and people can sign up to book them um, and then, you know, advertise them in the usual way, ad hoc way um, on various mailing lists. Now, it seemed that part of the idea of this was to bring some clarity because it did start to seem to us like there were these, there were more and more, uh, you know, bar boffs that were happening in meeting rooms that had nothing to do with the bar, um, and they were looking more like boffs, which go through a, a more formal approval process. So the idea was to draw a brighter line between these things. It sounds like maybe that hasn't entirely worked, and that's, that's very useful feedback. Um, but that was the idea uh, behind them. Other people want to comment? Yeah. Um, so on this specific point, in the wiki, you can also see which, like when the room is reserved, right? So at least you have like a notion about what's going on. But I totally understand that it's kind of confusing because you don't know where you need to be and who to talk to and so on. But like I think we as a community also agree that this is kind of a valuable part of having a face-to-face -face meeting, that you actually have the opportunity to talk to each other in the hallways, um, having a side meeting. And, uh, and, and the, the thing we're struggling with is like how to get this work at the right point of time back to the whole community to involve everybody in the discussion. And if you have further ideas, we would be more than happy to listen. I, I don't Just, have too many specific ideas, but maybe, maybe make, removing the two boff limit might be a good start. I don't know. Something that annoyed me for years. <laughs> Um, just the one one other detail here is that uh, there are some conversations that have started about uh, the the display of the agenda in the data tracker because it's got that has also gotten a, a little bit of lack of clarity of which events land on the official agenda and which ones do not and it seems like an area that's kind of ripe for um, a bit of an evolution in terms of how we represent things on the agenda for for clarity purposes. I see we have Spencer at the mic. Spencer, go ahead. Thank you. Uh, so I just wanted to say a couple of things real quickly. One is that uh, you know, the ISG has been talking about stuff like this for a while, and one of the things that we've been talking about ended up as being the hot RFC uh, sessions on Sunday night, but basically trying to say, you know, you can talk, you know, you can put together, we're trying to provide a venue where people can put together a group to go off and talk all week long. And I mean, you know, if a lot of the good ideas that went into that are for Aaron Falk, who has really been thinking about how to empower the community. Uh, the other thing I would say is that uh, the two-box limit uh, that's in our PCPs, it would take like one sentence to do a change to that BCP that says who working group for Moss. Because I, you know, I don't think that our con we, we use the word Bob to be conversations, but also efforts to form a working group. I don't, you know, I you know there, there was the idea that you don't want to have people coming back and try to form a working group with the same proposal like 35 times. But I don't know why we would ever cut off a uh, conversation that uh, we just have to call a boss so we can get, you know, get a room that's on the agenda and not be scheduled to get other stuff. Thanks, Spencer. Okay, Barry, I think you're next. Hi, this is Barry Lieb. I had one thing to talk about, but I want to follow up on this thing first. Um, we have done the, the, the IASA 2.0 boffs, there were more than two of them. So yes, there were. when it's the right thing, for one, as a general thing, I think the IESG has gotten better 
in recent years at doing the right thing, even when the right thing is not exactly along the letter of something that's written. And I think we should continue that. One of the things that the, the other guy mentioned was getting, having the ability to have remote participation in minutes and things like that. When we have a side meeting, however large or small it is, it's not connected to the rest of the community very much. And I think I'd like to encourage the IESG to be more lenient about approving BOPS, realizing that there are real scheduling issues involved here, so that more of these side meetings can be accessible to the community in those ways. The other thing I wanted to come back to the RFC++ BOPS, but in a completely different way, and kind of related to this, I really liked that it was scheduled with nothing alongside it. And this has been something I've pushed on for a while, that gen area boffs conflict with everything, and yet you know, there are always other things going on. Again, realizing that there are real scheduling issues involved, I'd like to encourage you to make the first edition of a gen area boff as conflict-free as you can manage, because it's really helpful to be able to get the whole community in there. Thank you. I think Aaron was next. Hi, Aaron Falk. I have a, uh, it's a new topic. Um, so uh, my principal area of involvement in the ITF is the transport area. And uh, transport is <laughs> obsessed with finding qualified area directors um, because it's been a challenge for years. And um, one of the changes that I've seen, I think across the whole IESG, has been a real effort to reduce the workload to try to get to something that's closer to half time instead of close to full time. And so uh, this is a question for the whole ISG is I'm wondering, is that what you're doing? And if you're, if you're getting it down to half time, um, are you able to keep up with your work? Is there stuff that's falling off the plate? What is it? You know, if you have to prioritize what's not getting done, is this a strategy that's working for us or should we think of something else? Have you I am not saying, able to get mine down to half time, so you guys better talk. <laughs> I, I was going to comment. I think uh, we have a mix of people uh, between, you know, some of them are working half time or thereabouts. Uh, some are working full time. I'm pretty close to full time myself, for example. I, I believe that Alexi is, is somewhat lower than that. But between, among the, the three uh, art area directors, we can cover the art area um, because we have sort of that, that mix, that balance. And I know that um, it's like we've, we've given instructions to NOMCOM that we, you know, we can have people who aren't full-time, but we can't have everyone not full-time. Warren? Sorry, let me just add on to the list of things that I wanted to hear about is, are you able to keep up with the reading? Do you know what's going on in your working groups? Um, or is it sort of a matter of benign neglect? So, sorry, keep going. Warren? So, yeah, I think as Adam said, it depends wildly based upon the person. I think it also depends a lot on how long you've been doing this for. I mean, this is sort of my second year. Um, for the beginning, I was definitely overwhelmed. Um, I didn't know what I needed to pay attention to. I still don't know what I need to pay attention to, but I'm less stressed about it. Um, no, I mean, I think that one learns relatively quickly which things um, you need to be paying a lot of attention to, which you pay, spend less on. For me, it's probably 35 or 40 hours a week. Um, so, you know, not really full-time, maybe kind of. <laughs> um, Depends on what country you're in. <laughs> yep, <laughs> true. Um, but, I mean, I know that there are a lot of people who manage to get this done in a lot less time. So I think it's how effective and how efficient you are, um, how much time you want to devote to it. Um, you know, I'm also good at procrastinating, so some of that time is spent, you know, rearranging my desk and sharpening all the pencils. Um, but as for am I managing to keep up with my working groups, I think so, I hope so. Um, no chairs have complained yet, but you know, if I'm not, please come along and tell me. I'm not sure what snark Jim came up with, but I'm sure some. Um, does that answer your question mainly? Ben. So I'm kind of in the uh, opposite situation. I'm in my... Uh, fourth year as an area director, and due to some job changes, I have historically had been 75% to full time most of the time. Due to some job changes, I've been kind of forced to push that down to 50. And it definitely has made some changes. Uh, I think it's doable. 
one of the things I've started doing is paying a little bit less attention to drafts that are outside my expertise and trusting the other ADs a little more. And I don't give as much editorial feedback as I used to give. Um, as far as keeping up with my working groups and things like that, I've probably become a little more squeaky wheel driven than I was before. Uh, but uh, if anyone, it, I have not been complained to, and I please hope any of my chairs or working groups that need to complain to me will do so. <laughs> Alvaro? Actually, yeah, so I think that what you're seeing is everyone experience varies a little bit, and I think we all develop our own little tricks and tactics of how to deal with the load. Uh, but what I want to add is that um, keeping up with the working groups and reading for the telechats is only part of what we do. We are also responsible for a lot of the policies around the IETF, and we need to talk about BOFs and agendas and a bunch of other things. So what that means is that, um, at least in my case, that the load varies quite a bit. You know, it's not that easy to say, well, I have every other week a telechat and I have to read 600 pages for that. But it, it varies because there are different topics. And, and so I think it's important to keep that in mind uh, in, in terms of how much uh, the ADs also want to be involved in those other discussions and those other things, which may mean driving some of the issues, uh, but it will also mean just you know, commenting and keeping up on those discussions as well. So there's a lot more than just the telechats. Okay, Warren, and then I think we're going to move yeah. on. Yeah, I, I think uh, Ecker was trying to get in at the very beginning and got okay. cut off. All right, can we bypass you, Warren, and go down this way? No, I was just going to suggest that you should stand for transport AD. <laughs> <laughs> Terry? Don't you think this would be a good question to get answered if somebody was considering such a thing? Be the change you want to see in the world, Aaron. <laughs> I just want to say that basically what I'm hearing is that it's a full-time job, that the half-time that uh, most people are doing it. I mean, ser seriously, um, I spend substantially less than full-time, so... Can, can, can you, you repeat that? Like, yeah. 30%? If you don't want to stand for a transport area AD, there's inter-area AD as well. <laughs> um, Is that what it takes to get a question answered around here? <laughs> so I, I would absolutely uh, well, I concur with all of my AD colleagues regarding the, the fluctuation of time. The, the other observation I would add is that being an AD will happily chew up as much time as you're willing to give. So if you want to give all of your week, your weekends, um, your holidays to being an AD, it will suck it up and it will love you for it. And the IETF will love you for it. But you must have some discipline. Okay. Can we... I don't want to suck up the whole meeting time. Yeah, so I okay. think this is good. Okay. We Very move helpful. On. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Hi, my name is Job Snyders from NTT. Uh, I'm a bit nervous about the topic I'd like to raise, and I would ask the audience to grant me safe passage when I've said my piece. Um, <laughs> because it means a bit of extra work for all of us. I've noticed that there is a significant stream of documents on the standards track that are uh, submitted to IESG that do not contain sections about uh, raising awareness of running code, nor are accompanied with implementation reports. What I expect from an implementation report is quite simple, that for each normative term in the draft, a implementer indicates compliant, not compliant, not applicable, or something else. And these reports are incredibly helpful, especially with large uh, protocol extensions or proto protocol modifications to assess the readiness uh, and, and operational considerations of said protocol. Um, so this means that I would want to promote the idea of having running code before things are submitted to the IESG. And I know some companies consider this a chicken egg uh, situation where they're like, well, we don't want to spend resources on something that's not uh, solidified as an RFC. But on the flip side, I want to encourage people to basically put their money where their mouth is. And if you believe in an idea, you should implement it on a beta branch or something internal. And I'm not asking for open source. I'm asking for 
running code because I think the standard track predominantly is about interoperability. And if interoperability cannot be demonstrated, I, I wonder why it's uh, in ISG review when it comes to protocols. So my question to you, in review, would it be possible to put more emphasis on researching whether implementations exist and what their status? Thanks. Do you want to go ahead, Alvaro? Sure. So um, I, I agree with you uh, in principle. Uh, I think that <laughs> just like every time I agree with you, it's in principle only. Um, you know, we are the ATF, right? We, we believe in, in running code. And I think that, that um, you know, some of the RCs that have talked about implementation uh, sections, for example, implementation reports are, are important. Uh, in the routing area, we have uh, several working groups that require implementations. Specifically, IDR requires two implementations, um, implementation reports and everything else, which is actually what you just said. For every should and must, uh, someone documents uh, how that works for their implementation. Um, on the other hand, um, I think that, that this is one of those topics that is probably better discussed on a working group by working group case, where in some cases uh, it is maybe more important to have those, that specific requirement to have implementations. In other cases, it may not be. So even for the routing area, we have IDR, which requires two, others require one, others uh, ask the questions, um, but it's not, it, it's not consistent. So I would argue that uh, from the point of view of time, timeliness, for example, of getting the documentation out and producing uh, actual results from the IETF, um, sometimes waiting for implementation might take a while. Um, I understand your point that if people don't implement, then maybe it means uh, we, don't, we don't need that. So I would suggest either you know, one or two things. One is um, as specific working groups talk about the, the specific needs, if you think that there is something that we really need from an IETF point of view that would change the requirements of um, how the RFCs, the, the, the standard track RFCs are, are produced and, and qualified, which would mean a proposal, right? So, uh, you know, write something down and, and get the community to, to talk about that. So, yeah, following on from that, I think that this is best handled on a working group by working group basis and sometimes on a sort of case by case basis. Some documents don't really, even standard track documents, don't contain stuff that can really be implemented. It more talks about, you know, how you do stuff. Um, when this was first discussed in DNSOP, I was somewhat resistant to it. Um, but recently, I've got a document that I'm co-authoring with Dwayne Vessels, which got implemented in the hackathon. Um, and somewhat because of what had been suggested, people wrote back, you know, this bit is not clear when I tried to implement it. When I tried to implement this, this bit is not clear. Um, so I think this is, you know, case by case, working group by working group, but I think that there is definitely value in, even if it's not a formal implementation report, just, you know, implementers providing feedback, I tried to do this and I didn't understand what on earth you meant in section 12. Ecker? Yeah. Um, but I, I certainly think implementation is pretty important. I don't, I think we shouldn't confuse that with implementation reports. Um, you know, um, speaking of some protocols I've been involved with, both TLS 1.3 and Quick have like seven to ten independent implementations that have some degree of interoperability. Um, and you know, um, 1.3 is on the RFC and we're already a pretty substantial fraction of like TLS traffic. Um, I'd be pretty sad if we had to spend the amount of time it would take to document that every normative, every 2119 term in the document had been implemented by somebody. That would be a lot of bookkeeping and I don't think we'd add enough incremental value to be worth it. Um, so if you have seven or eight implementations, you certainly are not the target audience for my work. <laughs> okay. Um, I can sympathize with the reasoning that this is working group by working group, but I think as a default, ITF should encourage that implementations exist and it should perhaps be a working group by working group opt out of this standard behavior rather than that per working group we decide, well, maybe we want implementations. Ben. Word. Ben. So I 
pretty much agree with the choir so far that this should be a working group by working group thing, but I'm going to give a little bit of a counter opinion is that I am uh, nervous about putting more structural barriers into getting draft to propose standard. And I think if we're going to, and I agree if there are implementations, having the reports is really good. Um, but one of the big differences between proposed standard and internet standard is internet standard does require at least two interoperable uh, implementations. And maybe one way to look at dealing with this thing is to, once again, we've tried this, we've talked about this many times, but once again talk about maybe we can put more emphasis on progressing things from uh, proposed standard to internet standard. My final points, if you don't mind. In both IDR and DNS op, there are no internet standards. We only have proposed standards. So in my mind, the requirement of having two implementations kind of has shifted to what we thought would be the weaker category, but actually is what we run and how the internet functions. So pushing this into internet standards is a approach, but I, I would personally love to see um, more work on implementations at earlier stages um, in the process. But thank you for your consideration. So last bit, um, on the opt-in versus opt-out, etc. cetera, uh, a while back, I can't remember when, I think it's actually all of routing had a requirement for two, um, two implementations. But then there was a RFC published, I think by Fenner wrote it or authored it, yeah. um, yes. removing that as the requirement and going back and looking at the history for that would be interesting. The way that that happened though was there was an RFC published. I think if you're proposing this, what would be reasonable is write it up in a draft and we'll discuss it and everybody can chime in and then we will have basically send text. Sounds yeah, so RFC 1264 created the requirement and uh, 4794 eliminated it. So might be worth looking into the history. Wow. Thank you, Thank you Deborah, Respect. for sending us the numbers. <laughs> Uh, so I think Carrie was next, yeah. Hi, Carrie Lynn. Uh, this goes back to Shane's question. You, Alyssa, mentioned at the outset that there's going to be some agenda experimentation at the next ITF, reserving Friday as sort of a day for free-form meetings. I'm wondering if you uh, and the IAS, do you have any um, thoughts about how structured those meetings will actually be and whether we will be able to use uh, resources like Medico to actually include external people. Um, I, I'm, I'm thinking if this becomes, you know, really an interesting trend, lots of meetings ad hoc in, these, in the final day, things may spill over into the final weekend or the following weekend, you know, extending this, uh, you know, even longer. So anyway, what, what, what thoughts about structure and resources? So I, people can correct me if I have it wrong, but I think the plan is to have uh, some rooms that have Medico and, and projection, your typical kind of facilities for um, a regular working group meeting. I think that's what we wanted to do, but just give people more flexibility to schedule them ad hoc. Um, so I think about structure at this point, it, it's very unstructured because it's an experiment. If more structure is needed or whatever is needed, it's something we will learn from this experiment. Um, but I have also heard ideas about, for example, research groups taking the opportunity and have like a whole day meeting on that day and these kind of things. So I'm, I'm really excited to see what will happen. I think you were next, Phil. Okay. Uh, well, I'd like to start by saying thanks for, I mean, this has been one of the best ITF meetings I've been at, you know. Every, uh, you know, never run out of food at any of the snack breaks. Every meeting has been in a room that's been of a, a reasonable size. Uh, you know, everything has just worked. Uh, and I think, uh, you know, congratulations for the people who organized that. But I was saying that by, because I also want to give my thanks to Aaron for organizing the uh, Hot RFC which I have found to be very useful because it's connected me with a lot of people who are interested in the ideas I presented that, you know, they're security ideas but are not really relevant inside the security, they're relevant in applications that might have a requirement. I think that that's an experiment that does work. To go back to the first question about ad hoc meetings, if I'm designing a protocol, 
I do not invite a hundred of my best friends to invite it with me. The reason I come to ITF meetings is because if you want to affect the internet, you, you don't need a hundred people to design a protocol, but you need a hundred people bought in to start deploying it. So I think there's always got to be sometimes when you're going to say a small group is going to go off and work on the focus thing alone and you know that's just the way that you have to do so that you can move fast. However, when people do that, they have to bear in mind that the decisions they make in that cabal have to be, you know, they have to be sensitive to the people who weren't allowed into the cabal. And that's not a decision that they've made in private. That is a proposal that they've made in private so that they don't waste the time of a hundred people thrashing out things in a forum that aren't ready to be thrashed out. So I think it's a question of tone and acceptance of the fact that you're not making decisions. Thank you. Just, just to tie your, two of your comments together, I think part of the reason this venue is so great beca is because it has so many spaces where small groups of people can sit down and have the kind of conversation that you're talking about. So um, thanks. John. Uh, two quick questions. I'm not going to make speeches tonight. Um, uh, the first is that as we look at meeting participation figures, we're seeing an increased number of remote participants on whom we're getting more and more dependent, including uh, I noticed tonight for good or bad reasons, IAB and ISG members. We've got a number of procedural bars to treating remote participants as full participants. And I'm wondering, as a very general question, when or if the ISG intends to address that question. The second question, um, somewhat related actually, uh, is that you mentioned during your summary that there's an appeal pending. That appeal interacts with some of the things that have come up tonight about the openness and transparency of the leadership process, and I'm wondering what the ISG's time frame is for addressing it. So on your first question, can you just elaborate about the, the barriers? I just want to make sure I understand. Uh, we've got a nomcom which will not allow remote participants to participate. Uh, we have a number of things tied to the nomcom eligibility rules, which discriminated against remote participants unless they're getting to most meetings. Um, we do, we have historically done, as others have mentioned this evening, a number of semi-informal but not very informal because they're officially authorized meetings which do not allow remote participation. Um, I don't know whether that's a problem or not. And the question is really not uh, that I'm looking for particular solutions. It's that I'm asking if the ISG considers this important enough to address and if so, what the time frame is. Thank you. So I think just on the issue of general interaction between remote participants and in-person attendees at the meetings, uh, the way that the IESG has thought about this is that we are fully supportive of the remote participation facility. We think it's great. Um, we think it's you know it's been extremely effective at helping bring new people in and support people who can't make it to the meetings and so forth. Uh, we do like to optimize uh, if we have to have a trade-off between um, the uh, accommodating re remote participants and accommodating people in the room. Um, if we're going to be in the room, we're optimizing uh, for in the room if we have to make a trade-off. Um, but uh, in many cases, we don't have to make a trade-off, so that's good. I think on the issue of, of non-com eligibility, that's a real issue, um, at least in my mind, there's been a few other pending large administrative matters uh, before the IETF, and it's hard to do too many of them at once. Um, but I do think it's something that we need to talk about and, and potentially address in the future. So it's definitely, uh, definitely something for us to take on. As, as, as I tried to say, I'm not chastising you for prioritizing other things. I'm just hoping this will not get postponed forever. Fair enough. And, no? Anybody else? No? Okay. Oh, the appeal. Sorry. Uh, yeah. So, <laughs> of course. 
Um, so uh, we are discussing the appeal. We discussed it this week. We're working through a response, uh, which we intend to have out in August. That's Thank you. based on vacation schedules and so forth. I think you're next, Glenn. Glenn Dean. Um, so as a person who uh, helps organize a side meeting every ITF meeting, uh, one of the challenges I have is getting people to know where it is and be able to find it. And while the, you know, we do announce things over email, it gets lost in the clutter of the actual ITF week. We all get so much email. It would be a big help, even if you label it as this is a totally unauthorized, ad hoc thing that's going on that we have no control over, so you're in scary territory. A slot somehow on the official agenda structure. So you can actually say, we're in this room at this time, talking about this. If you want to come, come. If you don't want to come, meh. But that would be a really big help in coordinating these little side meetings. It would also give the opportunity for a bigger part of the community to be aware of where they are and where they're at and put them in their schedule when they're laying out the schedule for attending them and planning out their ITF week. Couldn't agree more, at least from, from me personally. Kathy. Kath Kathleen Moriarty, uh, just a quick suggestion as you go through the appeal or, or a question. Have you considered just reissuing the ballot on the conflict review since so much research and discussion has happened? It should be quite straightforward and it would be an easy way to round that out. So I don't really want to speak to the details of it because it's in sure. process. Um, yeah, just wanted to provide that as a suggestion because I, I think it would be a reasonable way to handle it. Thank you. Hi. So um, this week, we had the ANRW, I got the right uh, order of the letters, as well as the odd hierarchy. That I think it was a great way to mix the, and to open the ITF community to the research community. So I think having this um, workshop j during the week was a good thing. Um, the other thing I'd like to mention is that the AMS has set up a recycle badge here which, guess what, it's here to recycle the badges. <laughs> so I would like us that we try to fill this bin and um, not being the only one putting my badge there. Um, so on Friday morning, put your badge in this bin. Thank you. Thank you. Or better yet, Friday afternoon, because you're all going to stay for the whole day, right? Right, yes. Okay, no more questions for us, so I'll invite the IOC to come on up. Thank you. I'll invite the IOC to introduce themselves, starting with Kathy. Kathy Brown, the Internet Society. Lou Berger, NOMCOM appointed. Portia Wins Danley, interim IAD. Covered Einsberg, IOC. Alyssa Cooper, IETF chair. Glendine, IOC. Ted Hardy, IAB chair. John Levine, ISOC appointed, I IAOC. Uh, Andrew Sullivan, uh, non-com appointed. We have one question. I love this. Yeah, I know. I <laughs> Make it easier. Give you a token one. question so you didn't feel like Mike St. John's. Um, and, and, and Mike, bear in mind, I've only been IOC chair for about 40 or 40 hours or so, so go easy on me. Oh, this one's easy. I, I, I kind of miss the larger IETF logo on our badges. Why did they shrink? And can we get it back? <laughs> are, you are you arguing against recycling these badges, Mike, right after everybody clapped? I'm talking about printing the, bra the larger badge, the, the larger logo that was on these things instead of this sort of eye chart. 
We will make note of it. I do not know why they got smaller. And I, until you mentioned, I had not noticed. Because <laughs> I guess it's too small. <laughs> yes, Bob. Um, hi, Bob Hinden. Uh, so, I, well, first of all, I wanted to both congratulate you and offer my condolences, having done that job. But uh, mostly I wanted to say this is a great venue. I think we should come back again and again, because I know we're coming back next year. Anyway, it's really hard to do better than this. Thank you. I, I, I agree. This, you know, one of the things I've loved about this venue is the uh, huge amount of open seating for us to sit down and talk to each other. It, it, that's just wonderful. I love the venue, the seating, the open spaces. It's fantastic. Terry, who, Terry, who are you? Oh, sorry, Terry Manderson. No hats. But the bar hours are shocking. <laughs> <laughs> we have a drinking culture in the IETF. Many of us do drink, many of us socialize around drinks, many of us ratify protocol decisions at drinks in our little work groups. Whether they're good decisions or not, it, it's part of a bit of the culture. It, I know you have no sway over the hotel and their bar hours, it's just an observation. Um, so I'm not worried about the hotel bar hours here. I believe the hours in Montreal are at 3 a.m. <laughs> it, 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 it's it's not um, it's not the end time. It's the start time. Oh. <laughs> you mean they don't start till ten in the morning. <laughs> yes, sir. That's it. That's uh, that's 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 uh, I like that we're starting to rotate to different continents and. Uh, you know, having those regular rotations every year. But I think there's one thing that we should consider, and uh, this comes mainly from the travel budgets and having Asia meeting at the end of the year. And uh, having Asia, you know, in November hits many end of year travel budgets when you're even getting, you know, cut, cut, cut. And uh, trying to reorganize, you know, our meetings that can somehow fit for the more expensive meetings at the beginning of the year and the one that are easier, you know, to come by by the end of the year might be something, you know, to consider and see the impact of the attendance in person by the, you know, by the IT efforts. That, that's a very good point. It's something we have observed internally as well. Uh, so we have discussed experimenting with switching to uh, a slightly different rotation where we might do Asia as the March meeting. Uh, right now we have booked out through 2021, um, most of the venues are, are in negotiation with the venues already, um, but past that date, we're looking at doing that exact experiment you're suggesting. Yes, Bob. Just to also respond to that, so that's a very one region view of it. If you live in Asia, having a November meeting in Asia is great. So, you know, it is about balancing the pain. And you there's just, there's not, unless you want to just rotate, there's no way to solve this. That's absolutely true. Um, as I say, if we do it, it will be an experiment. We'll see how it goes. We've tried this way for a couple of years. Um, and, and as you know, if you look ahead in the schedule, uh, while we do try to have tried to keep to the uh, schedule of, uh, you know, North America in March, Europe in the summer, and Asia in the fall, we don't always do it even now. Uh, we, we do mix them up. The fact that we're here in the summertime and not in Europe right now is, is a bit of a change for us. So like I said, we're considering the experiment, we're gonna look at it. The big thing that really uh, influences our choice uh, and our ability to meet at a particular location is the availability of uh, meeting venues uh, that we can go to. Uh, one of the challenges we have faced in uh, Asia is the availability of venues that meet the IETF uh, uh, requirements uh, in November. And so one of the reasons, one of the other motivations we're doing is to look to see if that we start going to Asia as an experiment in March, if that opens up new venues that we can't access currently because they're already booked many years out in advance by other groups. Going once, going twice, gone. Yeah, be, Glenn, before you go, <clears throat> I might mention that if the schedule for the LLC, if the if the schedule for the LLC goes more or less as proposed, this may well be the last time we see. This is may well be the last time you ever see the IAOC. <laughs> so, 
if that ends up being what happens, I will think I hold the distinction of being the shortest serving IAOC chair ever. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. Enjoy your evening. <laughs>